Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, open our eyes to see your glory in this world, Lord, the things that you do that we are not even aware of, the blessings that you give us each and every day, the hedge of protection that you place around us, Lord. Even when there are times of suffering or trials or tribulations, we know that, that you are in complete control and we know that Jesus Christ is our steadfast rock. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, to live a life that brings glory to you, Lord. Lord, that that we live a life that, that loves you and loves others and does things for others so that they will ask us of the hope that we have, as Peter tells us. As we read, th uh, study through Corinthians and the last part of Galatians, Lord, just open our, our ears to hear your word and apply them to our lives. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you here, Lord, and the, the availability of your word and, and the times that we can come together in safety, Lord. Help us not to take that for granted, but be good stewards of everything that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this United Ministers of Reconciliation. That's the word we're looking for. Big word. Sherry was looking for some adjectives when she was in here, and she said one was harmony, and I was like, mm, kind of. But see, reconciled, reconciliation, means that you were a part of it one time, but something broke that, and you're reconciled back. You're made right back. We were created by God to walk with God, to worship Him, to be one with Him, to be in a relationship with Him because He desired it. Nothing that we did, but because He desired to have a relationship with us. Wow. Why? <laughs> Except because of who God is. And then He knew because of his, who He is and everything that we would rebel against Him, that we would want our own will, our own way, that we would not want to give Him worship and honor and glory and praise. And yet He still did anyway. And He knew that it would cost His Son being separated from Him, carrying the weight of the sin of everyone on His shoulders to be a sacrifice to buy us back, to reconcile us back to God. What an amazing God that we have the opportunity to praise and worship with our life. So you should have read this week Psalms 105 to 119. You should have read Galatians chapter 5 and 6. And you should have started in on 2 Corinthians and read chapters 1 through 5. I want to go through a few psalms that just hit at me as I was reading them. And the psalmist wrote these song, psalms many, many years before... It, anyone ever knew the name of Jesus Christ. We did not know that God became flesh and dwelt among us. We didn't know the love that Jesus would have to lay down his life for his friends. And yet the psalmist would write in Psalms 105, verses 1 through 4, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all of his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And the psalmist never knew who Jesus was. Psalm 106 starts out, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord who fully or fully declare his praise? Psalms 107 starts this way, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Psalms 108 starts this way. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all of my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. 
For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. And we know the name of Jesus Christ. Are you getting my point here? How can you live a life where you cannot proclaim the goodness of God that he would send his son to die for your sins so that you could be reconciled back to God, made right, not only back in a relationship with him, but adopted as his very own child. Wow. Then you got to Psalms 119, long psalm, longest uh, chapter, thank you, in the Bible. And if you're not familiar with it, it's an acrostic poem. Do you know what an acrostic poem is? An acrostic poem means that it starts out, the first letters do, and they could spell out something like, let's say Jesus. J would stand for joy and peace or for those who believe. E stands for eternal salvation and forgiveness of sin. S stands for suffering and dying to give me new life. U stands for uplifted from the grave to prepare a home for me. S means secure in his arms. My life will be a witness of God's amazing grace. Yeah, I wrote that one. Did pretty good. I stole some ideas from here and there. But, but that's what an acrostic poem is. And Psalm 119 is that way. It's the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters. There are 22 standards. Each have eight uh, uh, words, eight verses in each for 176 verses total. You'll see a theme about the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God in one form or another depending on what the, the uh, author used for that word how the Word of God sustains him. The Word of God lets me know who God is and know his character and his qualities and his ways and everything else. And again, the psalmist did not know that the Word of God would become flesh and dwell among them and lay down his life to save them. Maybe we, we should go back and read those psalms again looking through the lens of Jesus. And the reason we read God's Word, the reason we study is so that we can keep up to his holy standard which we never can do on our own, and that we can give Him the praise with our life, with our voice, with all of our being, with our soul, to love Him wholeheartedly with everything that we have so that we don't waste this life. Instead, we spend our time praising God. And the psalm starts out this way, blessed, meaning that they're in right standing, are those who are ways are blameless, who walk according to the law. There's the written word of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statues, and seek him with all of their heart. They do, not, they do no wrong, but follow his ways. Which again, you have to know his word. You have laid down precepts. There's his words again that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. We have the dilemma out there that no matter how much that I want to praise God, that I understand that I study His words, I am a sinner. And I am doomed for God's eternal wrath. Except that He loves me enough to provide a way. Jesus Christ, His one and only Son. The psalm ends this way in verses 171 to 176. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word, for your commands are righteous. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law gives me delights. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your laws sustain me. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. And Jesus said he is the shepherd that shepherds this flock. And those who hear his voice will follow him and not follow anyone else. What a wonderful thing to think about God's love through the lens of Jesus Christ when you read these Psalms. John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, lived with us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So now we can read the New Testament. We can read about the things that Jesus has done. We can see how he expounded upon the laws and the teachings where he would say, you've heard it said not to commit murder. But if you've had in your heart anger towards your brother, you might be guilty of that. We can see the things that he did and he told us that if we love him, we will keep his commandments and greater things that we would do 
and no greater love is there to lay down your life for your friend. So you started reading the week before last the letter of Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. And you finished, this, finished it this week. I want to remind you how that letter started. Paul, an apostle, this is verse 1 of Galatians 1, sent from men, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace from you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to do what? To rescue us from the present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to him to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So you've read the Psalms. You understand what the psalmist was saying. You've looked through the lens of Jesus how much greater that psalm should mean to you because you understand God's love even more because you know the name of Jesus. You know salvation. You have eternal hope and everything else. So how are you professing Him with your lips? How are you living your life? Are you studying God's Word? Are you united together as brothers and sisters, as the family of God, as His hands and feet? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 15. You brothers and sisters were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh rather than serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. You know what the number one reason for church failure is in the United States? Division, period. It's not that they don't have doctrine. It's not that they don't have love for the Lord. It's not that they don't have enough program. It's not that they don't have a big enough budget. It's because they can't get along with each other, let alone get along with their enemies. A body that is united will be able to function properly. A body that is divided will slowly die maybe quickly die and we are the body of Christ joined together by the Holy Spirit by Jesus by God himself to be the hands and feet of Jesus literally in this world ushering in the kingdom of heaven living counterculturally living different from the rest of the world so that they see our lives even if we suffer even if it's unfair so that they see that we live differently, that we live by faith, not by sight. That our nature tells us to get even, but we don't necessarily because we love first. And our love covers a multitude of sins. It heaps coals on those on their conscience. Because why in the world would we act and live this way when we would be suffering? And yet I contemplate all the time, how do we suffer in the United States for our faith? Maybe we're inconvenienced. I can use that word better. But suffering? And yet the churches, in the early churches in the New Testament suffered terribly for their faith. If you keep reading Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the de desires of your flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit which is contrary to the flesh. We all get that. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Hmm. Well, I don't do this like that guy. Oh, I'm being judgmental, aren't I? But I don't, oh, okay. But am I doing what I want? Do I live my life for myself? Or do I live my life for my God, my King, my Lord? Do I profess Him with my lips and is my heart right there with Him? And then do I love others and think of them more than myself? There's a big difference between just saying, I'm okay, and casting stones and really living and loving like Jesus, who told his, those who wanted to be His disciples. He said, if anyone would come after me, not only must he deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after, Jesus, follow after him, but Jesus said, I don't have a place to lay my 
head. I've given up everything to dwell among you so that if you believe and follow after me that you will dwell with me forever. <clears throat> Verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You don't struggle with that anymore because it's not even a, a factor. You don't have to worry about not coveting because the Spirit tells you to think about others over yourself. You don't have to worry about lying because the Spirit is in, in a different step than that. The Spirit tells you to tell the truth. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. Oh, I don't do any of those. Hatred? Not really. Discord? Uh-oh. Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgy, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control to not necessarily do all the things I want to do, but the things that the Spirit leads me to do even if it means a little bit of inconvenience or even, even more if it means suffering. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, continually walking in step with the Spirit, doing those things, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This letter is to the churches that they not become conceited, proud because of who they are, their right standing, whatever it is, provoking and envying each other. Not conceited means not vain, not proud. Not provoking means not challenging or not disparaging. Not envying means not jealous of each other. James tells us that's where our quarrels come from, and that's why some of us are sick and dying, is because of the quarrels we have within the body of Christ. And it ought not to be so. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks there is something, thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. <clears throat> then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all the good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. I think about, like I said, how much the church in this country does go after their own desires, tries to do things by their own ability rather than being in step with the Spirit. And the scripture here is clear that those who continue to please their flesh will reap destruction as opposed to eternal life if you try to f follow in the steps of the Spirit. So verse 9 says, Let us not become weary then of doing good. Not just proclaiming, but doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. If you keep reading Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 says, May I never boast except on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That if I fix my eyes on Jesus, I no longer live for the flesh. I am a new creation. I live to please my Lord and Savior, to be His, oh, we're going to get to this in Corinthians, His ambassador in this world sent out with his authority and his power. Verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision mean, mean anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to, it, to the Israel of God. 
Now, the NLT says it a little differently at the end, and I like this one. That was the NIV I was reading from. It says, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Nothing that we have done, but because God has done it. That you are a new creation, but you've got to realize that. You've got to allow the Spirit to guide you and lead you. You've got to seek after God, because He has already sought you out and made His salvation known to you. Verse 16 says, May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. And if we live this way, the world will see it. That brings us to 2 Corinthians, a church that I'm going to say was divided. <laughs> they were divided between each other. They were divided between their, their desires for the world and, and all the things that it had. And this is not the second letter that Paul wrote to Corinth. It's possibly his fourth as you read through. A church that was divided, ineffective, and dying. Those are my words, okay? As opposed to being what I titled this message, United Ministers of Reconciliation. They didn't know their purpose. They might have known it, but since they quarreled and were divided, they weren't reaching their purpose. Paul had already addressed many issues in the church previously. Claims of spiritual superiority over the others, Claims of immaturity, suing in public courts, abuse of the Lord's Supper, sexual misbehavior, arrogance, and a lack of concern for holiness to God. I hope our church is never labeled as any of those things. They had grown some, Paul commends them for doing that, but they still had a lot of growing to do. Have you ever heard the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way? <laughs> heard it? Yeah? Let me read you the lyrics. Because this so much is our mentality today, even as Christians. I state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway, and more, much more, I did it. I did it my way. Regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do. I saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the byway, and much, much more. I did it. I did it my way. Right? Yes, there were t times, I'm sure you knew, when, a bit of, when I bit off more than I could chew. But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all, and I stood tall and did it my way. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he is not. Not to say the things that he truly feels and not the words of someone who kneels. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Let the record show I took the blows and I did it my way. I'm labeling the church in Corinth again. I am. That they tried to do things their way and never understood a Lord so they never knew a Savior. There are those that do. There are those in the church today. But you are a new creation in Christ Jesus if you have believed in Him. The old is gone. And when people see you go through the trials and tribulations, whether it's called suffering or not, and they see how you act and respond and see that you love others and even are more concerned about them, then you can understand when we get to the part in Corinthians when it says the God of all comfort comforts us so that we can comfort others. Let's see. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is God. Jesus became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and laid down His life and rose again, proving His love and providing the way of salvation. And He offers you grace and peace so that you can have grace and peace even if you're being persecuted, even if you're going through some horrific loss in your life or some health problem in your life. You can have grace and peace because you belong to God. You are Jesus' church. You are part of His family. You are to live holy lives, living differently than this culture, and taking care of others 
while you proclaim the good news, even if it causes you to suffer. So I have to contemplate again, how do I suffer? Maybe you don't contemplate that. But I contemplate, and when, it, when I contemplate that, I don't necessarily come up with answers to how much I suffer. I come up with how much am I willing to go out of my way? How much am I willing to not do my will? How, am I, how much am I concerned about being inconvenienced? What stands in my way? What is entangling me or a snare for me? So that whatever comes my way, I am willing, and not only willing, but looking for the opportunity to serve God and to serve others. So as we keep reading in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Do you see a pattern here? Compassion, comfort, comfort, comfort others, comfort that we ourselves receive from God. Do you do that in your lives? Is that a priority for you? Not just being hospitable and taking in strangers, but bringing them comfort. Because if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they can never have grace and peace and joy. And they are searching, looking, and you are Christ's ambassadors to bring them comfort. Do you know God's comfort? Are you experiencing it in each and every circumstance in your life? Are you realizing that the things that you're going through, that, you're, that God brings you comfort in because He brings you through them, then you can comfort others with them. There's ministry that you have that you don't even know what you have. You say, I don't know about this and that. Your life will bring comfort to others if you proclaim what God has done for you. Verse 5, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Abounds. We don't get hung in these things that happen to us, but we reach out to Christ for comfort so we can look back how Paul was singing hymns at midnight while he was in jail. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort <clears throat> and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. That means that you make it through whatever you make it through and you help others make it through whatever they're facing. Wouldn't you do that for a brother or sister that was your actual siblings? I hope you would. Shouldn't you do even much, much, just as much for the brothers and sisters of, of Christ? Shouldn't you do it even for your enemies because they don't know the peace and joy that you have? You go through the things that you do so God can comfort you so that you can bring comfort to others. Paul says that he planned on visiting them, but he didn't make it to them, and he didn't want them to think because he didn't get to them that they couldn't count on Jesus. So in verse 20 he says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are a yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anoints us, sets his seal of ownership on us, and puts His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You are purchased so that you can be reconciled, made right back to God. You belong to Him, and the Spirit writes God's Word on your hearts. So as you read and you come into these circumstances, the Spirit reveals God's Word to you. So you know all the words that I said from the psalmist at first, and you know how they apply to you, especially because you know the love of Christ. So stand firm in your faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul didn't come. He didn't realize it maybe at first, but he was able to write them a letter instead because his heart was set on reprimand because of their behavior. That's why we know there's at least another letter. He says he's good that he didn't come. Maybe their, his letter, even though it was harsh, may bring them some comfort. Because we together are ministers of a new covenant, a new testament, a new 
thing to be proclaimed, the love of God, salvation for mankind through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's an unconditional covenant that can never be taken away from you. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are forever saved. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14, But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, <clears throat> to the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. Maybe you understood this, maybe you didn't. It helps to think about the the time and with the conquering of the uh, Roman Empire and everything and the processional when they came back victorious how was Jesus Christ victorious while he was marching to the cross and if anyone will deny themselves take up their cross and follow after Jesus they will follow in that processional that death leads to life not physical death per se, but dying to the flesh so that you can live by the Spirit so that you don't want your own way, so that you want to follow in the steps of the Spirit, so that you want to be like Jesus in this world. And that is a pleasing fragrance to God because you're obediently following after Jesus even if it means taking up your cross and it leading to death. That is comforting even though it's confusing to others to see that you have that kind of faith, that kind of hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Some said that Paul and his teachings weren't genuine because he was suffering, which is the exact opposite. Paul says he doesn't need a letter of recommendation, that the church themselves are his letter of recommendation. And he says that this letter is not writ one written on stone tablets or parchments. It's a letter written on their heart by the Spirit. And he says in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Because all that I want to trust in God's Word, and all that I read God's Word and try to understand how good He is, I am still a sinner. And the only way that I can be saved is because of His amazing grace, because I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of my faith. Now, verse 7, If the ministry that brought death, because the law was great if you could keep it, which was engraved in letters on stone, if, if it came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, verse 8, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? That's you and I learning what ministry we have and using what we've gone through to comfort others and to be a testimony. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Verse 10, For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. For their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because it can only be taken away by Jesus Christ. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is Spirit. Wow. Not only are you a new creation in Christ but you're constantly being transformed. Ephesians 2 sin says that we're the masterpiece that God had prepared for us since the beginning of time to do good works in Christ Jesus. And that's hard to do when I am selfishly thinking about me, myself, and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, The greatest treasure is found in the most common, fragile, and ordinary clay pottery. Did you think about this? I mean, if you went back to the times there again, there were uh, landfills like we have, but not with boxes from TVs and everything else that we've thrown away. There was broken pottery in it. Because the pottery they cooked in, the pottery they might have cleaned in, the pottery they ate in, it held precious things, it held common things. 
It was a Tupperware of their day, if you want to say that, I guess. But it would become broken. It was common. It was not expensive. Oh, sure, it could be made into more expensive things, but for the average person, it was something that they needed to use in and every day of their life, but was so common it got thrown away and there were piles and piles of broken pottery everywhere. And you, oh, well, let me just read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, The God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, because I am obedient to God's command, because I live differently, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So when that clay jar gets a hole in it from being crushed, being abused, suffering, however you want to put that, there's just a hole for light to shine through, isn't there? Because that clay pot is still standing, it's still there, it's not crushed because of what's inside of it is where the glory comes from. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So the harder I try, the more I am keeping God's glory from shining through me because we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down but not destroyed. Now I go back to the suffering and think of myself... What things am I, how is this clay pot of mine being stressed and cracked and everything to show God's glory? It can't be done sitting in a recliner watching TV, can it? It's got to be being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. It's got to be thinking of others over myself. It's got to be comforting them through the things that I've been comforted from. It's got to be praying for them. It's got to be spending time with them rather than spending time just for the things that I want. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be also revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive are being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but because of that, life is in work for you. In, for, you. for your light and momentary troubles are achieved for us and achieve for, for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is only temporary, but what is seen is eternal. Second Corinthians chapter 5. If your body dies, so what? If this tent is destroyed or blown away, if that reference, so what? I will receive a new body and it will be much greater than this tent that I am experiencing on earth. What can man do to me? So Jesus tells us, don't worry about, don't fear what men can do to you. Do to you. Don't worry about what you eat or drink, but focus your eyes on things above and build treasures up in heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Not for the scripture we've memorized not for the times we've even attended church or anything else, for the things that we have done in the body to be like Jesus in this world, even if it means suffering, and especially if it means just being inconvenienced and so forth. We're bought with the price, the blood of Jesus Christ, to be His hands and feet in this world. This should sober you up, period, if I don't go any further. But then you've got the mission is the next thing outlined. If I stopped right there, that should make you have sober judgment that you are going to account for everything that you have done in this body, with this body that you have. 
But if I keep reading, <clears throat> verse 14, for Christ's love compels us. It's the driving force that motivates why we move and breathe the things that we do. We are either fixed upon ourselves or we're fixed upon Jesus. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Can it be much clearer? Your life is not your own. As a Christian, you are called to live counterculturally, totally different, wholly set apart, not living for your own desires, not living to build up treasures here, but to do things that build up treasures eternally, that bring glory and praise to God. And while you're doing that, someone might come along and say, tell me about your hope. Tell me about Jesus. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Now let's get back to what I talked about, about division tearing up churches. <laughs> from now on regard no one in a worldly point of view. Why would I view you as any less or any greater than me or anything else? You are one organ in the body and you're one organ in the body or part of the body. And we're all put together because the Spirit has put us together that way to function as a body. And divided, we cannot function that way. <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, not from us, not anything that we've done, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of serving what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to live a life and proclaim a life, proclaim Jesus Christ in a way to reconcile men back to God. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Paul says it again, and he says it from this point that we are committed with this. If we don't do it, we are failing to do our part. Oh yeah, someone else will. And that someone else might be one that Jesus doesn't cry out that day to them, or they don't cry out to him, say, Lord, Lord, we did mighty works in your name. And he says, depart from me, I don't know you. If you are in love with Jesus, you should be in love with the message that he has because... He saved your very soul from an eternity apart from Him just by simply believing, not by any righteous work you've done. Verse 20, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Kim, are you texting, Sherry? Yeah. Is that how you feel? Is that your mission in life? Are you reconciled to God? Do you go through the things that you do so that you can bring comfort to others? As you read through 2 Corinthians, and you might want to go back and read 1 Corinthians, look at the divisions and things that divided that church from being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. God did His part. Are you doing your part? Do you truly believe? And if you believe, what is hindering you then from doing your part? Are you following the way of the cross? I know it seems hard. It's not something anyone desires. Look at Paul's example. I don't want to give up the things of this world. God created the things of this world for me to enjoy, but not for them to be idols. I'm rich in this world so that I can be rich to others. I'm free in this world to use my freedom to serve Christ. Are you in step with the Spirit? Are you ever increasing in the fruit of the Spirit? Are you listening to the Spirit as the Spirit nudges you and guides you along? How could you ever look at another human being, especially a brother and sister, and be judgmental or live in a state of division? when you're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'll say again, that's the number one reason that churches split and fail in the United States is because they cannot get along with each other. 
Do they truly know God's love and His message of reconciliation? Do they know His grace, His mercy? Be reconciled to God. No longer live for yourselves, but for Him who died for you and was raised again. The old is gone, the new is here. He has committed to me the message of reconciliation. I am therefore Christ's ambassador, as though God were making His appeal through me and you. Are we united in this ministry of reconciliation? Today you're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And then you're going to keep on reading. Because see, you've got to read this next. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you tell me what it means. You tell me what it means. You, because if you receive God's grace, you've received it. But in vain means that it had just blown it all. Maybe I didn't really receive it at all. Maybe I did, but I'm going to live a life that doesn't bring worth to God. I don't know what it means. You can take it however you want to take it. I'm not going down that road. What I'm saying is, Paul said, as co-workers. Co-workers. Let's look at that instead. Am I working with each other to reconcile people back to God? Or when it's all said and done, will I live whatever my life is? amounts to be in that will I live it in vain because I didn't truly believe or because I did and didn't do I, I don't know I know that I could live as God's co-worker for he says verse 2 in the time of my favor I heard you his favor he heard your cry to bring comfort to you and the biggest way he can comfort you is to forgive you of your sins and pardon you from an eternal damnation if you've heard that, today is the day of your salvation. I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So each and every day that you have the breath that God has given you, you should be living a life to please Him, to try your best to reconcile others, not be divided with others. Father in heaven, help us to live a life that brings worth to you. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to contemplate on things above, to think about all the things that you have done for us, that we don't deserve anything that you've given us, but you've freely given it so that we can freely give our lives in the message of reconciliation to others. As though you were making this plea through us, that you're counting on us, Father, I do thank you for this church that I do feel is very united and loving and kind. I thank you for the, the uh, privilege I have to serve here, Lord, with so many great and wonderful servants. Help us be united in this ministry of reconciliation. We thank you for the children that they're here also, Lord, and, and Lord, help us to be committed to bringing them up, to training them up, Lord, so that they don't depart from your ways. Thank you for the freedom that we do have to worship you, Lord, and help us to not take it for granted, but to use every opportunity that we have. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.